Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Okay. Hi, guys. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. I'm a little bit nervous. I don't believe I've done this ever. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's great. I think um, hopefully we'll be able to discuss certain things that you guys, if you have questions, I love interaction. I would like that as well. So I should probably introduce myself. Um, so my name is Lena Shenderovich. Uh, I was actually born in Kiev. Uh, <clears throat> so yes, is Chokolovki Privet. She said, "Devata Shkola, Stoshet Shtvarta Shkola." So, maybe someone is going to my school. That's pretty cool. Uh, then, at the age of sixteen, my family and I moved to the states, and I got my degree there uh, in counseling psychology. Um, I lived in Pennsylvania for many, many years. We're not going to discuss the numbers because <laughs> I've been there for a long time. And then I uh, recently I moved to Canada. Um, I've been practicing um, therapy for many years in Pennsylvania. I used to do a lot of groups on anxiety and depression. I used to uh, anger management. Um, I'm doing the same here in Canada as well. Uh, mostly just uh, individual therapy. Um, so what do I do? Uh, well, actually, first of all, see, I am nervous. I, I just want to say that my heart is broken and it goes out to all the victims of Ukraine. And I think you are probably the most courageous people that I've met, I've known. Um, I believe that we're definitely going to win this war and you are incredible people. So thank you for joining me. I know that some of you don't have power. Some of you are going to listen to uh, this session later today or maybe later this week, but um, you are definitely uh, incredible people. So what do I do? I am practicing cognitive behavioral therapy. What is it? It is all about thinking, a thought process, changing the thought process, changing uh, negative patterns. Um, I don't believe in changes. People cannot change, yay. So um, usually when people do ask for change, I, I just send them to a plastic surgeon. I tell them, go get some work done. You know, this is the only change that you can possibly do for yourself. Uh, but what cognitive behavior does is that you have to know yourself. If you're sensitive, if you have, if anger issues, if there's certain weaknesses that you need to know about yourself, Cognitive behavior will help you, will teach you how to um, deal with your weaknesses. So it always starts with the acceptance. You have to accept your weaknesses. You have to accept and understand who you are and what you are and deal with them instead of asking yourself, why do I have it? So cognitive behavior does that. It just helps you to think in a different way. Usually when I do sessions, I look for a pattern, right? We all have patterns, we all do. And so the unhealthy one will look at it and we're trying to figure out what can be switched, what can be shifted, what can be changed. And, and so people who overreact, uh, they learn how to uh, not to overreact or they learn how to use coping skills, positive coping skills, of course, because there are a bunch of negative coping skills that we are using, unfortunately. We are also um, creatures of habit. So even if we're miserable, even if something we don't like, it's something known, so we stay with that misery. Um, guilty as charged, um, the same way. Sometimes I have to ask myself, sometimes I have to, practice cognitive behavior on myself to figure out, well, what am I doing? Why am I like that, right? So um, cognitive behavior, usually I spend, I don't know, six months to a year with the client to help that client to deal with problems. 
Um, so it starts with the acceptance and then we usually look for a balance. We all have to have some balance in life. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfect balance, of course, but some type of balance, right? So for example, you guys are going through this catastrophe. It's, it's difficult. I can't even imagine. I don't know how you guys do it. Like I said, I should probably learn this from you. How you do it day to day, I don't know. How are you able to stay in school, focus, and, and deal with, you know, the war as well. It's, it's difficult. Uh, I can't even imagine. But self-care is important. Self-care is pretty much everything. Um, this is where you have to be selfish in a way to take care of yourself first. You know, the analogies that I'm using for that to explain to people because that guilt why am I doing this where I should be doing something else? Well, number one, you have to identify things that you can and cannot control. So things that you cannot control, as painful as it might be, you just have to let them go because you simply can't. So emotionally, you're draining. Emotionally, you know, you, you're getting anxious, you're getting depressed, you're getting angry, which is totally fine. But at the same time, you have to learn how to be selfish in a way, right? Because self-care is everything. So the analogy that I'm using, you are on the plane and the flight attendant is telling you what's going to happen. If the plane is going down and we're trying to avoid that, right, information, that piece of information, you have to put the mask on yourself and then you have to put the mask, I don't know, a child next to you or help the person next to you. For many, many years, I used to be so upset with that message. What do you mean? Well, if there's a child next to me, I'm going to help the child. I have to put the mask on first, and then I'm going to take care of myself. Well, the truth is, you really can't. You really shouldn't. Because if you're putting the mask and you are gasping for air, what's going to happen? You're not going to do it properly. And then the end, two people are going to die. So you have to do it first. You have to put the mask on, and then you're helping the person next to you. So that's how self-care is you have to help yourself and once you mentally are strong enough you can help people around you right um so it's extremely extremely important um unhealthy coping skills well there's so many i'm not even gonna go into that but for example unhealthy coping skills i'm thinking that a lot of you are spending a lot of time social media right you are constantly going on tiktok instagram facebook uh, constantly reading news constantly doing that i realized for myself when the war started that i was doing that i wasn't sleeping at night um i don't know my husband and i were constantly up trying to contact people trying to help financially mentally we were doing that and i realized that my mental health and physical health start to decline and that's these are the signs you have to realize oh my goodness uh we have to do something about it so i started reducing and reducing and reducing because it was really playing a number on me and my family so that was one of the things. And I remember I was helping. So I have some friends from school that still live in Kiev. And I was helping them. I was trying to help as much as I could. And it's interesting to see how, it, you know, I have two teams, unhealthy team and a healthy team, meaning the healthy one, um, they go to work every day. Uh, one of my friends is a doctor, the other one in real estate, they go to work every single day. They live their lives, they're trying their best. They're trying to balance. Uh, funny enough, one of my friends went on vacation uh, last summer and um, I was kind of speechless, but she did, she came back, she felt refreshed, she felt good, she felt that it needed and it's actually working for her. Every time something happens, she's very positive and positivity is helping her family as well. Um, and then I have a group of unhealthy friends who are not really listening. And so I kind of stop. That's also very important to realize when you're trying and you're doing something and it is becoming unhealthy for you because you get frustrated, you get angry, you get upset. How can they not understand it? 
it's also part of cognitive behavior therapy because you have to realize that you can always do what you can for yourself. Uh, we cannot. We cannot control other people. Unfortunately, we can. I wish we could. I wish I had that magic wand to use on everyone to understand. So I see some of my friends. They're constantly posting things on Facebook. They're constantly arguing. They're constantly arguing with. Russian actors who are uh, uh, pro Putin, they're constantly arguing and I've been trying to tell them what are you guys doing. And so their health is declining. And if you don't take care of your mental health, your physical health will decline as well. And so some of them are actually having some physical problems as well. But this is where I had to distance myself, realizing that it was also um, unhealthy for me as well. So realizing self-realization is extremely important, realizing that I can't, I can only do that much, so much, I just can't. Uh, it's painful, yes. You still care for these people, yes. Uh, part of cognitive behavioral therapy is also recognizing some toxic relationships. Uh, these sometimes are people we love. So don't ever put the every uh, emotion and feeling in the same basket. Meaning when I tell people, uh, it sounds like a toxic relationship. What I hear is that, but I love her or I love them. Or are you telling me not to love them? But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that love is a separate thing. Put it in a different basket. Love, we have unconditional love for a lot of people. We have unconditional love for our family members. We have unconditional love for our friends. But then everything else is realizing that this is a toxic relationship and I need to distance myself. This is not good for me. I love that person, but this person is not controlling uh, their uh, mental health, I cannot be around that person. And it has nothing to do with love. Is it difficult? Absolutely. Some of my clients complain about the, um, well, in session, they complain about me when I tell them that, right? They complain, they, they say that this is too emotional and it's too hard, but it's supposed to be hard. Cognitive behavioral therapy is not the kind of therapy where people come to see me and they, and I just listen to them. And some psychologists actually do that. They are just good listeners. I don't do that. I need a lot of interaction. I need people to talk to me. I need people to tell me uh, about their thoughts. Everything starts with a thought. Everything starts with the thought. You wake up in the morning, you open your eyes, and the first thing is the thought, right? Oh, I hate school. Oh, I have class in the morning. Oh, the weather is amazing. Oh, something else. Everything starts with a thought. You do have control over your thoughts. The thought process, it's a very slow a process to change, but it's something that's doable. It's something that can happen. And, and so it's a lot of work because misery loves company, right? We get miserable and then we like this and then we don't want to get out of it because it's known. And something that's known is just there. Uh, I guess um, another example would be uh, COVID. When COVID hit, we have no idea what it is. It's just so scary. It's scary, scary, scary. We're doing everything from home. We're doing everything online. And after a while, people got really comfortable. I still have a lot of clients who are uncomfortable. Their anxiety is through the roof, but now they, they like it in a way, right? They don't want to admit it, but I can tell because they're working from home. They don't go anywhere. Uh, food is being delivered. Um, they make money, they don't really have to, you know, go places. They love it, but they don't understand why they're still anxious because it's a very unhealthy lifestyle. So misery loves company. You have to be very careful. Uh, we are creatures of habit. So we get used to these things. We know they're unhealthy, but they're known it's there and we just stick to it. So be very, very careful with that as well. Um, a routine. A routine is something that's important. You look at your routine, you try to figure out why am I feeling that way? What's going on with my routine? To change the routine is important as well. Something is not working. Don't ever change too many things at once. I also uh, realized that when I have people, like when I get a new client, with a notebook and a pen and that client writes everything down, everything down that comes out of my mouth, I know right away this client will be overwhelmed 
discouraged and will disappear on me because you can't change too many things at once. It's not healthy. It's, it's doable, yes, but it's overwhelming. So you can't really do that. You, um, so in my experience, and I've been doing this for 17 years, 18 years, um, I don't see these clients. They don't come back because it's overwhelming. They find it unhealthy for them, right? They, they're trying to change 10 things at once. Um, it's, it's too hard and they just disappear. So you pick one thing to change in your life. You look at your routine, you look at your life, you identify what is it that you're going through. So if it's anxiety, what, and let's talk about anxiety uh, for a second. So anxiety, what is it? You're constantly worried, worried, worried. Is it okay to be worried about things? Absolutely versus anxiety. Is it okay to be anxious? Well, this is very, you have to be careful with that. For example, if there's an exam and you're worried about it and you're feeling a little bit anxious, that's totally fine because you're supposed to feel that way, right? You're about to take exam. So you're supposed to, you can't just be immune to it and say, oh, I don't really care. So that is a healthy anxiety when you're uh, constantly anxious day after day and that feeling is really heavy and your chest is heavy and then it becomes very physical as well where you have heart palpitations you feel very weak you feel um foggy you don't even remember much you it's sort of like a severe panic attack then you have a problem. And if you don't take care of it, it will attack you physically. I had a client uh, years ago back in Philadelphia where something happened to her and she was coming to my anxiety groups thinking that this was enough. She was just there. She was present. She never talked. She never participated. She was just there. And I realized that, and she wouldn't talk. So she was there. She was there for a while, a couple of months, and then she disappeared. Um, few months later, I was uh, walking in the hallway and I heard someone calling my name. I turned around, there was this woman, I had no idea who she was. And apparently it was the same person. She was seeing a doctor in my clinic and she was on oxygen. She had a walker, she couldn't walk. And what happened was the anxiety really affected her, not just mental health, but her physical health as well. She had a lot of uh, medical problems at that point. Uh, she was taking medication and, and that was that. That was really, really scary. That was a good example for me to understand that I have to try my best. Obviously, I can only do so much to help these people to understand that you have to help yourself. I'm here as a guide. I can guide you. I can help you to understand what is it that you're doing wrong. Um, but I need a lot of interactions. I need you to be willing to change, right? Uh, also, you have your comfort zone. Identify your comfort zone, stay in your comfort zone, stay, 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 but you have to get yourself out of your comfort zone. You do something and you come back because if you stay outside of your comfort zone for too long, it will trigger anxiety as well. Uh, depression. People get depressed. Well, what is depression? Depression is feeling sad. But what would be the difference? You can feel sad. It's totally normal to feel sad. It's actually good to cry because you still have to release your emotions, right? If there is that emotion that exists, we need to use it. You're feeling sad for a day, for a week, even for weeks is fine. But if you are feeling sad for a month after month, then it is defined as a depression. If you do absolutely nothing with that, it will turn into a clinical depression. And in my experience, clinical depression needs to be treated with medication um, because it leads to really some serious, serious um, actions, uh, suicidal thoughts, suicide, uh, suicidal attempts, people get hospitalized. So it is important. It's mental health is really everything, um, you know, and some people don't take care of it. They ignore it because they feel that it's going to get better. A lot of people culturally don't really believe in it. So I do have some people, clients from uh, former Soviet Union, and they're the most difficult ones. <laughs> um, that's why I always ask, and in the beginning, uh, I get anxious because I, 
I know what culture I came from. I know that a lot of people don't believe in mental health. Uh, I heard multiple times, get it together. You, what anxiety, it's in your head. Uh, get it together. You just have to be stronger. You're weak. And when you identify as a weak person, you just want to stop. You don't want to do anything, right, at this point, because you don't want to be called that. But unfortunately, Eastern European culture, it, I mean, it, it's getting there, but I think, you know, uh, people need to be more educated. They need to be exposed to, you know, get some knowledge. It's important. Exposure therapy is also a big thing for cognitive behavioral therapy, where you have to expose yourself to these things. You have to understand without making these beliefs because self-made beliefs are very hard to change. Mm -hmm. I have these people who come up with something that makes no sense and it's all based on their life experiences. But if you're not exposed to different cultures and different ideas and different people, then, then your beliefs are very limited. And again, it's, it, it, it's a decline, it's a mental decline. So it's extremely important to understand that um, People from former Soviet Union are probably the hardest clients I have. Uh, that's why I have very few of them. Um, the younger generation is definitely more work and they're seeking help. But then there are a lot of people who are being forced by their doctors. And I can tell right away, okay, they're just here because they're being forced. If you're being forced, then nothing can be done. Uh, they come, they leave, they don't really believe in it. So it's, and again, you have to identify it. You know, in the beginning, I used to think, oh my God, I just failed a person. I can't, I can't control other people. Like I said, I'm there to guide. Um, a lot of people also have mentality, oh my God, I have a, a therapist now, so I'm good. I'm good. I'm, 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 I'm going to be okay. You're not going to be okay because, you know, having these sessions is not really enough. I'm doing some pro bono cases and I have a few uh, Ukrainian refugees that I'm working with. And it's interesting to see that. So I have a few people in their twenties and I see changes right away because they're trying to escape uh, not avoidance, they're escaping through learning coping tools that are actually helping them, helping them to move forward, helping them to identify problems, helping them to realize what they can control. Um, and then I have a few teenagers who actually came to Canada with their parents and I'm just there for support, but nothing else, nothing is really changing. Why? Because of their parents, right? So I tried to do sessions with their parents and it's not helping, it's not working. Oh, nothing is good here, it's not good enough. We, um, everything is better there. I understand that. And I understand that we, you know, creatures of habits. So we wanna go back to our own country. Uh, we wanna be there, we wanna be in our own comfort. But what they're not realizing is that they're not helping their uh, kids. And kids, we, we put our parents on pedestal, right? It's very, very difficult because we put them on pedestal. We feel that, you know, whatever we've been told as children, everything was right. Calm down, put them off the pedestal. Realize that your parents are just your parents. These are regular people who happen to be parents. They're okay to make mistakes and you need to identify those mistakes as well. You need to realize uh, that this is not okay for me. This is not good. Again, it has nothing to do with love, right? There's a basket of love, the unconditional love that we have for people that we love. It's always there. But realizing that maybe what they're doing and what they're saying is not exactly a good thing for me right now. So you have to reset boundaries. Boundaries, boundaries, boundaries is everything. Every relationship you need to discuss, you need to realize that boundaries is everything. If something is not working, reset boundaries. You're not a bad friend, you're setting boundaries because your mental health should come first. You're not a bad daughter, you're not a bad son, you're not a bad uh, friend, you're just resetting boundaries because if there's a toxic relationship, your mental health will decline. So this is kind of my introduction to cognitive behavior. This is what I do. I need a lot of interaction. I need some questions. I need to understand because guys, I mean, as much as I feel for you, I'm not there. 
I don't really understand. I don't have the full understanding of what's happening, right? I see it, I read it. I, I had to limit myself. I had to take care of myself so I don't stay up all night. I don't read because it's important. It's important to know. I know, I know what's happening. I know how bad it is, but I can't be spending all day reading the news, uh, which also I was, I was uh, I'm gonna finish about my refugee clients. So the, the children, the, I have a couple of teenagers and they're not doing well. Why? Because the parents are constantly doing, they're not really changing their behavior. So these kids are constantly in the same environment. They're in a very unhealthy environment. So they were taken out of that environment, which is actually very, very um, beneficial for cognitive behavioral therapy. When you realize something is happening to you and you need to get out, physically get out first. Sometimes that physical push is important. We say, and, and when I say get out, I don't mean to leave the country. I mean, not everyone can, not everyone wants, and totally understand that. But mostly it's uh, what we say in the psychology world, it's hard to get better in the room where you got sick. So if you're sitting in the room and your head is spinning and you're getting anxious and suddenly something happened and you just can't stop, and you really can't. You need to remove yourself. You know, sometimes I have a lot of children that I'm working with, like teenagers that go to college, and and sometimes they get really, really anxious. Uh, they leave. They leave the room. They come back. They take some. They use some coping skills. They come back. You have to start controlling. It's not just one approach fits all. So I can't just be talking about one approach and I'm going to tell you it's going to work for you. Why don't you once this this uh, lecture is over, you can go ahead and try. I don't really know what's going to work. You have to try multiple things till you realize what's working for you. Right? It's based on your routine. It's based on what you can afford. It's based on who you really are. If you're sensitive, then there is more work to it. You know. Um, sensitive people also need to realize that you need more work. You need to protect yourself. And I know this because I'm an extremely sensitive person. I remember my days in school and, and a lot of times I would get anxious before, like even back in camp. Uh, all these exams, I absolutely hated. I School was just for me to have fun for, for a long time. I absolutely loved school uh, because I had a lot of friends and it was all that. But with, with taking exams, taking quizzes and tests, it was a big deal. I really needed a lot of support and help and understand. And there was not a lot of understanding back then, right? You don't understand what anxiety is. So you feel like there's something wrong with you. And sensitive people, it's just, it really is part of personality. You cannot change it. I have a lot of sensitive people asking me, I'm sensitive, can you um, help me not to be sensitive? I cannot, it's, it's part of personality, I simply can't. But there are so many tools that you can use to help yourself. Avoidance doesn't work, I'm telling you right away. A lot of my people used to get really upset or have examples, look, I've been avoiding the situation, it's been working. It, Avoidance helps for a very short period of time and then it just hits you even harder. So avoidance is not a healthy coping tool at all. Um, yeah, uh, I need some help. I need you guys to interact with me. I want you to ask me some questions uh, or maybe, do you, do you have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? So you, you can ask me in Russian, it's totally fine. Like my Ruski is okay. <laughs> Any questions? Your Ruski is okay, Lina. <laughs> Lina is my, my Ruski is, is okay. <laughs> I, I mean, my Mujni she touched to my Ruski is okay. Uh, he makes fun of it a lot of times, uh, but my Ruski is fine. Um, yeah. Any questions? No. Yes. No. Okay. Let's go to to discussion. Давайте запитання Ліні. Що би хотіли спитати? Я У мене є питання. Извините, камера мене підвела. І простіть, що на русском у мене просто відвратительний акцент. Тому я не буду подходить. Русський підходить, акцент твій все підходить. Я извиняюсь, що я не говорю на українському, але, к сожалению, я навіть не буду починати. <laughs> it's not good. Go ahead. 
Пожалуйста, спрашивайте. Вопрос о вас. Вы впитываете столько жизненных историй разных людей. Как вы боретесь с такой штукой, как выгорание? Потому что в вашей профессии это даже страшнее, чем в какой-либо другой. Ну, мое личное мнение. Я согласна. Сто процентов. Uh, so, in the beginning of my career, it was tough. I am probably in the beginning, I was so gullible, such a gullible person, meaning, я всему верила. Ко мне приходят, ко мне говорят, I come home, I think about it, I'm trying to solve, this is where I didn't realize. You know, textbooks and grad school is not enough. You're in grad school, you feel that, you know, going through all your classes, you are, you're not, you're not really ready. Practice makes it perfect. So it took me a while. It took me a uh, burnout. No, it didn't happen. But I realized that I was trying, I was dragging my work. I would bring my work home and now I have roots. Uh, it stays home, it stays at work. My work stays at work. I'd rather work extra hours with, Uh, finishing some notes at work and, and staying maybe late. But when I'm done, I'm done. When I come home, I completely remove myself because it is important. Burnout is such a um, realistic thing. Uh, I actually do have a lot of clients who take off work because of the burnout. Um, this is where you don't have a balance. When I was discussing balance, and balance is important. So you're trying to balance your life. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, but I'm trying to balance it where, so with my work, and then when the work started, this is where I, when I realized, oh my God, my mental health is declining. I wasn't sleeping, I was working, and then straight from work, oh, and between my clients, I'd be listening to the news, and I'd be something else. And then I knew I had to stop. So I, not that I got immune to it, but I have, I have boundaries. What I was talking about, boundaries is important. I just simply don't bring my work home. And, and, and that's about it. I, I can give a, a client empathy, but it just stays right there. Um, and a lot of people take empathy as something more. For example, I had some clients thinking that I was becoming their friend. I'm not your friend. I can't be your friend. It's unhealthy. You can be friends with a therapist. It's one of the ethics. It's one of the rules. We can really be friends or we can be therapists for our family members or our friends or people we know because it's unhealthy because this is where your friendship is, is probably going to be ruined which is also difficult. I talk to my friends a lot and sometimes what I hear is painful not to say anything. So it took me years to realize, okay, you have these friends, you have to be friends with them, you can't be saying. And sometimes when I feel that I really need to say something, if someone is kind of complaining about something, I do ask them, do you want an answer of, from a friend or a therapist? And the answer is usually a friend because they already know the answer. They already know what I'm going to say. So as a friend, I just listen. As a friend, my friend is my priority, but I don't give them these sometimes some rough answers, sometimes rough uh, advices that I know they might not like. I just can't because it will ruin my relationship with them. So I am not being fake But I'm also being very uh, realistic, also understanding that I have my own weaknesses as well. I have so many weaknesses. I have so many problems. Uh, I also know that the grass, and it's important to realize the grass is never greener on the other side, right? So we all have problems. And, and so, yeah, boundaries is probably the only thing that is helping me to realize and I know the importance of mental health obviously I have the knowledge so knowing the importance of mental health is helping me to realize that no this is not what I'm going to do it's like your gut feeling you know over years you develop that skill and your gut feeling where you know no I'm not going to do this and you don't feel guilty about it because guilt 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 is you know guilt is ruining so many lives A lot of times people want to change and then we discuss certain things and all I hear is, oh, and then I felt guilty. I started doing what you told me and we discussed this and we set up a, a short-term goal. 
but I couldn't do it because I was feeling guilty or you told me to do this, Lena, and I was doing it. And then I just failed because, because it was, uh, it was getting worse. Well, use your, you know, head, use your brain and understand that just because we discuss something, it can't just be done bluntly. It has to be, at some point you have to realize, okay, well, we talked about it, but right now is not a good time. So, it, you know, uh, go with your gut feeling, go with the comfort and, and, and make changes at your own pace. Don't make changes just because we talked about it. Don't be a, a, a little soldier. You know, uh, in two weeks, I'm going to see Lena and we discuss this and it just has to happen. If you're forcing yourself, you're most likely going to fail. Use your gut feeling. You start with something very mild and you make that change. But yes, but for me, it's um, over years has gotten pretty easy because work is work. And when I'm home, I'm home. I hope I answered your question. Uh, thank you so much and uh, I have my personal story about uh, thank you that you said about that sorry <laughs> the the uh, no no <laughs> thank you um, that uh, therapist cannot be friend because I yeah. have my personal story uh, when yeah. I I was so lonely that I asked my therapist to be my friend and after a session I realized how unhealthy it was and now I don't have therapist unfortunately. <laughs> okay okay but but it is important to figure out and not it's sometimes I have clients where I realize it's not going to be a good relationship as well uh I can't like I said I'm there for guidance and they have sometimes I you know the first question I ask what are you looking for? What are you looking for? If you're looking for someone who is gonna give you um, not just guidance, but gonna tell you what to do, is gonna get really involved in your life, then you are not, I'm not the right therapist. Definitely interaction, yes, definitely I will guide you. But a lot of people just don't understand the boundaries and we discuss the boundaries right away. But so I have cases, I had cases where I knew right away it wouldn't work. And I, just a few people that I would transfer to different therapists, I would recommend different therapists for them. Um, I also have a story uh, back in Philadelphia, I had one client, she came to see me with the severe anxiety and she wanted to, she was a lawyer and then she changed her mind. She didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. She decided she wanted to be a nurse. Okay. And so she was back in school doing nursing, seeing me, uh, highly educated, amazing, but with uh, anxieties because there was no balance in her life. Every time she was with the men, she would drop all her friends. There was no balance. She would stop talking to all her friends and that guy was her world. It's a problem. When people say that my partner, my husband is my best friend and a lot of people are gonna disagree with me right now, but your husband or your boyfriend, your partner is everything to you. It has nothing to do with not being honest with him, but I don't think your partner should be your best friend. It's important to have friends, a friend, at least one friend. It is important. It is important to keep that balance because what happens is things happen. Sometimes we lose partners, sometimes we, things happen, right? People break up, people get divorces, people die and you lose your world. And that's exactly what happened to her. It was her pattern. Every single time she was with the guy, she would drop all her friends. Every time she would come to see me, you know, running to my office, crying her eyes out because she just lost a partner and she lost her world. She has no life. Lena, I have no life. Well, where's your world? You dropped your friends two or three years ago and now no one is interested. So it is important to have that, important to have that balance, important to remember that you have other people in your life. And, you know, your, your partner is everything to you, but at the same time, balance is important. It's also important for him to have a life, right? It's also important to tell him, go see your friend, go do something, uh, you know, and I'm going to do something else. It is important. It's important that feeling of missing someone, it's important as well. So um, yeah, uh, 
so going back to that client, she, we had a very good relationship. And then she flew to, she was taking medication for anxiety. She couldn't control it. So she was taking medication. She flew to Vegas with her boyfriend and they broke up and she was staying there because there was a hurricane. So all the flights were canceled. She emailed me. <laughs> no hello nothing the email says i need you to go to my place i'm out of meds i need you to go to my place get the medication and send them to me to vegas and i remember i read that email and i remember thinking wow we, something went wrong at some point and i didn't even realize it right and so i waited obviously i did, I did absolutely nothing i deleted the message she came back to see me a month later um she wasn't going to talk about it. She was going to avoid it. And so I brought it up and I told her that this is unhealthy. You and I are not friends. And I don't know. I apologize. I don't know at what point we realized that we were. And um, I was going to transfer it to someone else because it was unhealthy. But we were able to reset boundaries. We were able. Uh, she was highly educated. She kind of understood. We were able to reset boundaries and continue uh, therapy sessions. So there. You know, where is the, the, I don't know, where is the difference where uh, psychology finishes and psychiatry begins? How can we distinguish these two things? Every country has a different mentality about that. So, um, in the, so it was difficult for me because in the States, the way clinics set up, it's both. Uh, maybe pharmaceutical company is a little bit pushy and it's more um, advertised in a way. Um, so, and, and cultural differences play a huge role, a huge role in, in this field because the clinic I was with, uh, one of the things you have medical insurance, you come to see me, you come to see me, but you have to have a psychiatrist. Even if you're not taking medication, you still have to have a psychiatrist. And so having these constant meetings with psychiatrists, I always knew what they were on. I could always, you have to be very careful with psychotropic meds because they're not just, you know, it's, it's not a headache, right? Uh, you take a lot of pills. Uh, sometimes you get immune. Sometimes you get some side effects. So you have to have a, a good relationship with your psychiatrist to understand what you need. Um, but it was it was pronounced definitely more in the states. So I felt very comfortable understanding when someone is not able to control anxiety or depression, or I see that it's no longer a depression but a clinical depression. We do discuss medication, and sometimes for anxiety, I have people on medication for 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 months and months and months. Why? Because it's pretty severe. It's where you're not just getting anxious and then you're able to control it. If you can't control it, and, and, and sometimes it has a lot to do with chemical imbalance, you're prone to anxiety. You have to be careful. Don't be afraid to go and seek help because, because severe panic attacks. If your life is being changed if your lifestyle is being changed, right? People stop working because of panic attacks. People stop going to work. People have anxieties uh, taking public transportation. I have people like that or you're being in crowded places. You're changing your lifestyle. Cognitive behavior is not enough. Or sometimes cognitive behavior is not working until you start taking medication. So I felt very comfortable in the States telling people, look, Look at look what's happening. Look, look at your life, right? A lot of changes have happened. Um, you're not able to, you're not doing well with cognitive behavior because you need that push, you need that help. And again, that mental block in your head, and sometimes it's cultural. Oh my God, I'm gonna be taken, I'm crazy. Yeah, you know, back in the day, I remember being a school girl, we, you know, we used to say, Oh my God, you're crazy, go take a pill or um especially if you lived in Kiev, the, the most popular thing was Balnitsa Pavlova. <laughs> so I do remember that. Oh, you did Balnitsa Pavlova. So I do remember those things. And uh, times have changed. Time has changed. If your lifestyle is changing, don't be afraid to seek help, uh, take a medication. It will help you. And so when therapy is not effective, I do mention the medication. I do tell people, okay, let's discuss this. We can even, 
a lot of an exposure therapy. This is where you have to use exposure therapy. This is where you have to say, you know what? Uh, these are the meds. This is what's going to happen to you. Uh, you're not going to be, because people have that perception that they're going to be different, that they're going to become zombies, that they're going to become different people. No, you're just going to be, it's going to feel lighter. You're going to make better decisions. You're going to go back into the routine that you miss so much, right? And so, so that was more acceptable in, in the States. I moved here four years ago and suddenly you can't talk about the medication. Canadians don't really like the medication. They want to try harder. So for a while I was doing that and then I realized, I'm so sorry, it's not really working. When someone needs a medication, someone needs a medication. So I slowly, I know my people, uh, I built the relationship first. So I will never tell someone who is gonna come see me right away, oh, I think you need a medication. And you need to, you know, need to get to know this person first of all. And after a while, once the, the uh, relationship is built and the trust is there, um, I feel that comfort, you know, I go with my gut feeling and I do sometimes you can avoid the medication. You have to help yourself. If you're getting depressed, if you're feeling sad, and like I said, day after day is fine, but month after month, you have a problem. You need to start doing something about your depression, right? Changing your routine, using coping skills, different coping skills, uh, self-care, you know, doing things that, and you need to, that feeling of guilt, you need to completely put it away, like try to remove it, start doing things that yoga helps a lot, hot yoga is freaking unbelievable, I'm telling you right away, mindfulness, breathing exercises, people usually tell me, well, you said breathing exercises, I was doing, um, I had a panic attack at work, and I was like trying to breathe, and it didn't work, well, you were just doing it for the first time in crisis. You don't try anything new when you're in crisis. When you're in crisis, it's like calling 911. It's like going to see, to seek help right away, right? You're not gonna learn how to swim while you're drowning. You're gonna scream for help. It's kind of the same thing. No, but you have to help yourself with breathing. You know, if you do it for five, 10 minutes a day, no more than that, you're helping your lungs, you're making your lungs stronger, you're doing this, you're fighting the way you can, using coping skills to help your depression, but then depression turns to clinical depression, and when I see that right away, I do talk about the medication, because at this point, it's really highly unlikely you're going to get out of it without any medication. Okay. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Lina. Um, actually, in Kiev, there are a couple of centers with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy who are working together with psychiatrists. So basically, so they are moving person to a psychiatrist and then back to a clinical psychologist to work. So for that reason, I was asking you that question. Guy, you, you, you need both for sure. Uh, hello, uh, can I make? A question. Uh, so uh, I would like uh, to ask you a lot of questions, but I uh, have uh, my phone charge is very low. So, uh, <laughs> what are uh, effective ways, uh, your effective ways to abstract different problems nowadays uh, uh, without uh, meditation, for example? And what kind of literature do you recommend uh, to study uh, nowadays? Uh, again, it's not one literature fits all. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm doing cognitive behavior, obviously, I'm going to tell you, why don't you read the cognitive behavioral therapy? Um, the, it based on your lifestyle, whatever your lifestyle is, you know, a lot of people, when I talk about yoga, they say right away, I'm not going to do it. Right. So there's, it takes some exposure and some, um, education. And maybe I usually tell people, why don't you try to come back to tell me that you didn't like, um, trying mindfulness, trying changing your lifestyle. If you feel you know, going to the gym, if you feel that your social life is lacking, then you work on that. If you feel that whatever's missing, whatever's not as balanced, you kind of trying to add more or um, nutrition is also very important, right? So eating well as much as you can, um, exercising for sure, um, talking about health, 
mental health is important to a point, again, trying to balance it. So you don't find yourself spending days and days talking to your friends about your anxiety because you kind of making this even deeper and you know a bigger issue. So, but discussing is also very helpful, right? Be, um, be open-minded to uh, understand that some people are not gonna understand. And so without, you know, feeling, irritated with people or angry you you know you have to find the right people you have to find the right people it doesn't have to be the person who you're trying to change your mind about what you're going through for example so but having these people is important it doesn't have to be a therapist it could be just someone who is a good listener but of course you need to be a good listener as well um um what i was gonna say i mean Guys, I do understand that right now, you know, you're uh, you're very limited to so many things. I mean, what are we talking about? There is no power. So some of you are struggling every single day. Uh, but the best thing that you can do for yourself is actually limit uh, social media. Try to stay away or give yourself, I'm not going to say try to stay away from social media completely. Let's just be realistic, right? There's realistic thought and unrealistic thought. And so, but try to limit it. Try to be more structured. Try to have a structure where you would only be on social media for like an hour a day. Is it unrealistic? No, I think it's pretty realistic. Is it difficult? Absolutely. Of course, it's difficult because you're right there and you have neighbors and you have friends and everyone is going through the same thing. But you have to think about self-care. So social media would be number one. I see how damaging it is for people uh, in Ukraine. I see what some of my friends are doing, obviously not listening and spending too much time arguing with constantly with people on Facebook. Uh, I used to read their arguments and now I stopped completely. I muted them because it's not good for me and they're just doing their own thing. You know, I was told that I don't understand anyway. And so I get it, I get it. But um, social media right now is probably the most damaging thing that we can do to ourselves. Um, and, in, and in terms of books, in terms of literature, honestly, um, Cognitive behavior is because I'm, I'm all about cognitive behavior. I only believe in behaviors and reactions and thinking and overthinking. And when you're overthinking some, so it depends what you are dealing with, right? What are you dealing with? Are you dealing with sensitivity or are you dealing with overthinking? Or are you dealing like, what is your pattern? Identifying that pattern, just, just Google any type of information, just Google and, and you know, don't get anything too thick. Don't get any thick books because that's overthinking again. You really get into that. You're really gonna get into that and you're gonna be you know, um, applying everything. It's not good, it's not healthy. Uh, I always tell people just you know, find an article, something that you're dealing with, something that you're struggling with, find a, a good article, take it as is and let it go don't live by that book, don't live by that article, as long as you have some knowledge. I don't know if I answered your question correctly. Um, do you have any more questions for me or you wanna clarify maybe? Do you have, I don't know. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I got it. Okay, all right. Can I ask a question? Yes, hi. Yeah, uh, what I was thinking about recently is that uh, after the war ends, uh, there will be a lot of uh, young guys, uh, combat veterans, and uh, uh, those guys will return home with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, how do you think, uh, to what scale the problem is, uh, how do you find the problem important and what actions can government take and what actions can those people take to deal with it and to get back to a normal life? PTSD is a huge thing. Thank you for bringing that up. I was actually gonna talk about it and I forgot, I completely forgot. So PTSD is a huge thing. Uh, usually it hit, it doesn't hit you right away, right? It hits you a little bit later in life. Um, statistically, three, three months later, six months later, um, scary, 
absolutely. Uh, needs to be taken care of, absolutely, right away. But again, uh, you have to realize that most people are not going to be doing it. Uh, this is what I'm thinking, but I could be wrong. A lot of people are not going to recognize it. A lot of people feel that I have to go through this because you don't understand, right? You're going to be probably hearing that a lot where people are going to tell you that you don't understand what I went through. You don't understand what I saw. Absolutely. You know, these are all facts. But unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of people probably not going to seek help. PTSD is a huge uh, thing. It's actually a pretty dangerous thing. I have a few clients with PTSD, uh, something that happened to them 20 years ago, not realizing that it's been affecting them. It's been affecting their lives, their choices in life. Of course, a huge thing. Yes, hopefully, you know, uh, Ukraine will provide a lot of centers, you know, something maybe like a, a short term care, at least to help them. A lot of people will be will need medication for sure for depression, for anxiety. Uh, it depends on who these people are. It depends on their personalities. Um, realizing that also that. You have to realize that there's nothing you can do. If someone is telling you something that you don't understand, you're not going to argue, right? You're going to walk away. And that's just it. You know, something happened to me years ago. I was back in, I was living in Pennsylvania and my friends and I were uh, at the swimming pool. So I'm in a changing room and there's this woman next to me. She threw my stuff. We had a bench and th she threw my stuff off the bench. And I looked at her with this belief, looking at her and, I'm, and I said, are you insane? What are you doing? And she said, but that was many years ago. I was back in, I was still in college. And she said, I need that bench to myself. And she started screaming and yelling. And I just kept looking at her thinking, oh my God, this is crazy. I don't understand what's happening. So I had my friend next to me and my friend, again, exposure, the experience, I wouldn't even look. She, my friend lived in Israel for many years and then she moved to the States. She told me, she whispered in my ear, she said, look at her um, arm and she had numbers here. She was a Holocaust survivor. I didn't know, I would never look because I don't see people who are Holocaust all these days, we, you know, most of them are gone. But back then I, I didn't know, but I guess when you live in Israel, it's, it's just there, right? People are more aware. And she whispered in my ear, she said, walk away, just get another bench. You don't understand. She is not okay. Years later, right? And, and so I remember thinking, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, that was my reaction. You know, making these statements, thinking that this woman is absolutely insane, but that is a PTSD. These people never came out of it. These people never really um, uh, were able to, to it, it just stays with you for life. She, I believe, I probably most likely, and back then, you know, there was no therapy. So my hope, this was my experience understanding that PTSD is serious, yes. It needs to be taken care of, yes. Most people needs to be on medication, absolutely. But unfortunately, a lot of people are not going to do it because, um, some of them are just going to live in their own world. They're going to find some comfort, which is also scary, of course. But you also have to realize that there's nothing you can do about it. You can't really argue with these people, right? Because argument will only make things worse. Um, so my hope is that there are going to be a lot of a lot of centers helping these people, uh, helping with medications, helping with uh, therapy, helping them to get over something that was so, you know, uh, it's a huge trauma. It's traumatic, it's trauma. It's for them to realize, um, you know, um, they survived the war. Uh, so it's gonna be a big issue for sure, um, yes. Yes, yeah. thank you for that, for that answer. Yeah, I also, that there will be like centers and maybe some helplines and stuff. stuff. Yeah. I read that there are some of those centers planned already in long term, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Important. Hopefully, hopefully, because because it's gonna it's gonna be a huge issue, uh, and 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 sometimes it could get dangerous, right? Because not a lot of people have the understanding. Not a lot of people know what PTSD is. 
So it's also a huge thing. I don't know what's wrong with you or people will argue, people have different personalities. And so it could get dangerous at some point, of course. So hopefully it's gonna be taken care of right away. So people are, uh, will get the help that they need for sure. Is there any correct behavior when you meet a person with um, psychological- Oh, it got choppy. It got choppy. Natasha, can you repeat the question, please? The question was, is it the correct behavior with uh, people with this sort of problems? Uh, people with- You, you, you have seen this, uh, this lady and your friend has explained to you what was going on. Uh, how, using your knowledge, how should we behave? How uh, behave around people like her? Yes. Uh, you not responsible for this person. Uh, you have to realize that's what I'm afraid of, that people will be arguing a lot. My biggest concern is that because people don't understand, right? They don't understand this. This is all, yeah, oh, you were there, you were fighting, but I was here and I was doing, and so a lot of arguments will lead to bigger problems, honestly. That's my uh, prediction, unfortunately, um, because because you just have to actually walk away. It's the only thing that you can do. You know, it doesn't, it's not gonna make you weaker. This is not the argument to win, right? This is not an argument to win because that person is, I'm gonna say that PTSD is a mental disorder. It is a mental, just like anxiety and depression, it's a mental disorder. It needs to be taken care of. And when it's not, that person, yeah, is sick, mentally sick. Uh, with that lady, oh my goodness. I mean, the reaction's been there for years and years, right? Um, she was with a friend. It's not like she was lonely or anything. She was with a friend, but that reaction completely threw me off because she just completely threw my stuff on the floor and she said, I need the bench. So of course, me back then, that was my reaction. Me back then, and there's gonna be a lot of people reacting the same way. I'm not the kind of person who's gonna argue. So, but I was shocked. And I just kept staring at her till, till I was given that information. Well, I was lucky enough that I had my friend there, right? Who gave me the information. She was the one who said, look at her arm. She has numbers, Lena, walk away. Not that I was arguing, but obviously that, that is important to recognize. There's no points to argue. You're not having a discussion with a friend, which is also going to be a problem because family members and friends who are at war right now will be coming home. And it's, it's really the only answer I can tell you is that hopefully they will have a lot of centers. They have a lot of centers. People should be on medication, of course. And when it's your loved one, it's, it's going to be difficult, but the only advice I can give you, don't argue. There is no argument uh, because they're gonna get so comfortable with that, right? It's, it's the kind of misery they're gonna be building only because they need help right away. It's like 911, like all these people are gonna be in crisis. They're gonna feel heroes as they are right now, but when they come back and suddenly the world is not no longer moving in the same direction, right? It's no longer, there's no, you know, you, you felt like a hero there, now you're back and you don't know what's happening because we got used to things. Uh, no matter what, it's a family member, it's a friend, it's a partner, it's a boyfriend. There is no point of arguing. You have to be there. You have to be consistent in terms of, you know, mental health. Let's go, let, not accusing. So it's also important the way you deliver it, right? Delivery is important. If I bring a hundred people in my office and I um, ask them to deliver one message, it's gonna be delivered in a hundred different ways. We all have different deliveries. So it's important not to accuse that person. It's important not to say that you're crazy or you need help, do you understand? That is not gonna work well. That is not gonna go well. So what you have to do instead is you actually have to be able to um, give empathy, be that listener, but also understand, find a way to tell that person that, hey, do you wanna go with me or do, you know? But once you realize that it's not working, once you realize, because you can absolutely cannot control other people, as difficult as it is, as painful as it is, it's part of cognitive behavioral therapy. You can control other people. You have to be strong enough to walk away because 
it's damaging your mental health. Empathy, yes. Be there, yes. But trying to change that person's mind, you absolutely cannot. So hopefully, you know, it's like when, like in the States, uh, I was in a few, when I was in grad school, we had a few accidents. Uh, a school bus uh, had an accident and a lot of kids were in trouble. They witnessed someone getting killed in front of them. And actually my niece was on that school bus. She was the only person who was totally fine because I remember asking her, I said, um, so we as grad students were sent to help them crisis right away, helping them that minute to, to realize that they need to put that behind them. They were little, they were like uh, seven, eight years old. She was the only one who was fine. And I remember asking her, I said, hey, Erica, what did you see? And she said was, I saw nothing, I closed my eyes because I didn't want to see it. But every other kid was looking through the window, seeing that person chopped. That person was really chopped in pieces. She was the only one who saw nothing and she was totally fine with it. Every other kid needed a lot of help. And they were in crisis. So that crisis center was there and we were part of it. We, were, we had to go and part of our internship, helping kids right away. So. Hopefully these centers are gonna be there right away, helping these people right away. Because the longer you wait, the harder it is. It's like that depression, right? You're feeling sad, you're depressed, and then you get to that clinical depression. It's kind of, it has the same effect. The longer you wait, the more difficult it is to, to help the person. But they have to be willing, they have to be willing. If there is no willingness, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are gonna be walking away feeling that I'm a hero, I'm strong enough, I don't need it. But unfortunately, it's something that can be avoided. Okay, thank you, Lina. Any other Here questions? Yeah, can I also ask a question, please? Hi. So, hello, Lina, it was really nice to meet you and to a very interesting lecture that you have given to us. And my question is that, um, you know, what are the best techniques to deal with anxiety that is very well connected to, with, to some previous patterns, I mean, from the past? For example, you failed in the past uh, at public speaking, performing, or maybe teamwork, and now you, you get anxious uh, even thinking about it, you know? So maybe there are some advice or techniques to cope with that. With, with much ease. Uh, so this is your problem or you just, you're just- Yeah, it was my problem in the past. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was my problem actually in the past and I'm also, I'm almost like uh, dealt with it, but still I would like to please hear some advice from you as well. Okay. Uh, so let me ask you a question. What coping tools have you been using in the past that were helpful uh, more or less? actually facing my fear. That, is, that was the best technique, like uh, practicing, practicing, and then you get used to it and that okay. makes- well, Practicing, practicing, practicing is not exactly facing your fear because sometimes <laughs> facing your fear is gonna give you a, a, a more anxiety just, just doing that, right? You have to be very yeah. careful. What I was saying, so this is your comfort zone. This is where you live. You're trying to change something. You take yourself outside the comfort zone but you still have to, you always have to bring yourself back into your comfort zone. If you stay outside of your comfort zone, your anxiety is going to go through the roof. It's only going to get worse. So you have to be careful with that. One change at a time. Remember, uh, practice and practice and practicing. That is pretty much, that's it. That's what you said. And so uh, I had clients having that fear. Some of them, what some of them did, like one of my clients got this amazing job, lots of money, happy with it. The anxiety was through the roof. She had to run some of the meetings. She couldn't do it, but she didn't want to take the medication. So she took public speaking class online, practicing, practicing, practicing. It actually helped her a great deal. Uh, she was able to speak because in the middle of it, you know, you, you have these severe side effects, right? Suddenly you need to run to the bathroom. You have a headache, you are throwing up. I mean, there were some severe symptoms that she was dealing with. So um, public speaking class really helped her. 
I, uh, um, I swear to God, I mean, I'm telling you this because it actually works for so many people. I only use and talk about things that actually are working for people, for clients that are well, um, help me as well. So one of my friends kind of forced me to do it. And so now I'm doing it. Yoga is amazing. Why? It's giving you that balance. It's giving you something that you're able to relax. So in the beginning, I said, yoga shmoga, I'm not doing it. And one of my friends really, she's like, okay, I'm going to bribe you. If you do it, then we're going to go out and whatever. And I said, fine, do it once. I mean, I go, I go to yoga classes more often than her now. And she's laughing how she created a monster out of me, right? But the truth is, especially hot yoga, it you you need that balance. It's giving you that. It's like, think about this, when, when you have problems with your lungs, and so you're giving these exercises to make your lungs stronger. So when you're in crisis at some point, right, your life can be in crisis all the time, your lungs are strong enough, and, and suddenly your lungs are helping you to control different situations. It's kind of the same with anxiety, practicing, practicing, practicing change your lifestyle a little bit. I do understand I'm being completely realistic. I do understand that considering what's happening to you guys, it's, it's, it's really difficult. See what you can do. See what you can do to, to, with practicing, yes, it's working, but you need a lot of things that will help you to relax. Like relaxation techniques do work. Don't do it for too long. Like mindfulness works. Absolutely. Mindfulness never do for more than five to seven minutes before you go to bed, before or early in the morning, you're laying in bed, you're listening. I always tell people like do Google or YouTube or whatever. Do it for a very short period of time. Not when you're in crisis, because once you're in crisis, you don't really need anything. You just try and right? like when you're drowning, you're not going to learn how to swim. It's kind of like that. But um be careful with facing fears because when you're forcing yourself too much, usually there is like a bigger problem that arises. right? You have to be very careful with that. Uh, facing your fears, mm, I wouldn't say that, but finding ways will deal with the problem because you know it can be avoided. Public speaking is a tough one. I had that problem and I was forced in grad school every single class I had to do public speaking, public speaking. So I, practicing, yes. Uh, relaxation techniques, yes. Um, I mean, as, uh, I know you, you're gonna laugh about it, but a lot of oxygen, our, our brain needs oxygen. So trying to go outside and just for 10 minutes, uh, taking breaks all the time, but oxygen actually works. Just like when people say, oh, eat a lot of fish before your exams, it's gonna help you. Oxygen does actually work. Your brain needs that type of relaxation. So you do these little things, Plus, just remember, you're doing those things for yourself, realizing I'm actually doing something, I'm controlling. So that self-awareness is going to help you uh, over time. This is not just, you know, this is a magic wand and it's going to happen. But you also need to accept the fact that you're prone to anxiety, right? So instead of fighting the anxiety, you have to realize. It's like when people say, I know this about myself. I just need a little bit more time to process. Kind of like that. I know that I'm prone to anxiety. So instead of like fighting the anxiety, I'm prone to anxiety. So these are the techniques or it's going to take me longer. I need to practice more. I need to do these things. Don't use them as a bad thing. Use them as a, you know, acceptance. This is part of who you are. It's not the end of the world and you can just deal with it. Just change your routine a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. We wanted a discussion, Lena. You've got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you guys for saving me. I was afraid. I was like, I do interactions. I don't do lectures. I did not go to school to be a teacher. I cannot do that. I need a lot of interactions. When I have clients who don't talk, oh my God, talking about frustration. I get so frustrated. I'm like, can you tell me anything about yourself? I don't know. I don't know. So I have a rule don't know is not accepted. It's the only rule I have in my office. The answer don't know is not being accepted because I just cannot handle it. Part of, part of my self-care because if I, I, I get upset with it, I can't be upset with my clients, right? So, so it's, it's the rule. I have these rules and yeah, interaction is everything. Uh, so thank you. Everyone was amazing, more than amazing. Have you thank got you any too. questions to, to Lina? Or we may thank you for 
an interesting lecture. I hope it was helpful. I don't know about being interesting, but I hope it was helpful to some of you guys. Like I said, my heart goes out to you. I, I'm not there, but my heart is there. You know, um, it's so difficult. It's so difficult. Um, I can't wait to talk to you guys when the war is over and we can actually, you know, talk about post-war maybe uh, things that you know, a lot of you guys be dealing with and dealing with people who are gonna come back from work. Thank you very much. You're it's welcome. Incredible lecture. Well, thank you for having me, Natalia. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. We'll keep Bye. in touch. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, take care. <laughs>